Good morning, everyone, and good morning to our wonderful panel today. And given the amount of attention and time in the program for ecosystems, it's wonderful that you're all um, here joining us. Um, my name is Natalie Novick. I lead research at tech.eu. Um, but my background is a social scientist, and I've spent uh, the last six years working um, across three different continents interviewing entrepreneurs and understanding some of the challenges and some of the opportunities we have in early stage entrepreneurship. So I'll give my panel um, each a second to do their little elevator pitch and introduce themselves. So Rhett, let's begin with you. Sure, um, thank you all for coming. It's great to be here, uh, especially with uh, my fellow panelists today. I think this is gonna be an exciting discussion. My name is Rhett Morris and I am the, uh, Wow, looks like people can't hear me. It's no, a bit closer, I'm All right, so my name is Rhett Morris, and I am the director of Endeavor Insight. Um, we're a research organization that's a part of Endeavor, and we work uh, to research ecosystems, um, or what we would call entrepreneurship communities, across the world. We've done work in several dozen cities, um, doing kind of deep uh, analysis of the networks of entrepreneurs with partners like the Gates Foundation, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the Kauffman Foundation. And really excited to be here uh, with all of you today. Uh, good morning, it's, good, it's great to be here um, with all of you and fellow panelists as well. Uh, my name's Ian Hathaway. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I do is um, I do research on entrepreneurship. Um, including entrepreneurial ecosystems, startup ecosystems, whatever you want to call those. Um, thankfully, I have the opportunity to, you know, work with that some in practice as well uh, through advising uh, governments um, and private sector organizations who are participating, uh, who are stimulating those efforts, um, and also get a, to work with startups as an advisor and, and, uh, and mentor. Tina, my name is Tina. Uh, I'm from here. I came back to Denmark after being away for 10 years and had started my first company in Australia and then noticed that there wasn't really any ecosystem here, that I didn't know who to go to. So I decided, like m entrepreneurs do, to just see if I could participate in creating it. And uh, the way that it turned out was, uh, obviously, it, some of it has gone well, that's not all my efforts, but look how many people are here now part of it. 10 years ago, there would have been six of us around a six pack of beers that would have been easily sufficient. But um, I tried to play my part and I've done that by creating co-working spaces. So I created Founders House here as the first tech co-working space. Then we created Startup Village. And now I also have uh, Mesh in Oslo. I have a place called Dix in Trondheim. We just opened Matrigel 1 here on Hoibro Place not that long ago. So today uh, I have about uh, 25,000 square meters of uh, co-working space. And the reason that we're doing it is actually to be the infrastructure. We found out that when people meet regularly, good things happen. Wonderful, and we've you've mentioned it a few times, startup ecosystem, startup community, entrepreneurship community, just so we're on the page, uh, the same page. What does that mean to you, and what are some of the features that are involved? I believe Ian has a fantastic answer <laughs> for this. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I don't know, I, I guess I like to think of the startup, uh, well, so whether we're calling them startup communities and startup ecosystems, entrepreneurial communities, entrepreneurial ecosystems, um, I like to think of the community as like the beating heart of the startup ecosystem. It's sort of uh, the center of that universe where the individuals and organizations on a day-to-day -day basis are working with founders. So that could be founders themselves, startup employees, organizations that provide physical space, advice, programs, et cetera. Um, but then, you know, then there's this whole ocean of individuals and organizations like governments, corporations, universities, et cetera, et cetera, that um, are useful resources for the entrepreneurial community. Um, the challenge, of course, is that uh, those organizations tend to be structured in different ways, have different incentives, aren't living and breathing this every day. So I think that's actually one of the main challenges with entrepreneurship in cities today is that you know, there are these two worlds that uh, can work together better, but the, the challenge is how that's linking up. And I would just build on what Ian said by um, adding that I, I really prefer the word community. And the reason for that is though there are lots of different kind of institutions and organizations, whether it be universities and governments and big corporates and uh, younger kind of startup companies, um, ultimately the institutions themselves are not interacting and doing anything. It's actual people inside the institutions. Mm -hmm. And so I think an ecosystem kind of abstracts us out from thinking about that this isn't just, it's really just people connecting with one another, people so who might work in government, who might work at companies, who might be entrepreneurs themselves. 
Um, and so that's why I, I think in our research we tend to use the word entrepreneurship community instead of entrepreneurship ecosystem. Wonderful. And, and Tina, that kind of ethos is something that is behind the creators community, which you're, you've developed. Yeah. Yeah, very much. Uh, I mean, I kind of see it as um, in the beginning, it was almost so small that it was a centralized network, right? There was a couple of people in the middle. They were connecting to everyone. The whole point has been to make it decentralized, of course. And today there's, there's thousands of, of nodes that all have their own little community that connects into the wider community. And I think that today the Copenhagen ecosystem is at a place where now our challenge is to figure out how do we get those bits to work together because it is almost like in your startup that in the beginning you can all fit around a table or sit in a small room and thereby you get you know what each other are doing and now uh, both in in Denmark but also in Norway and and in the other North Scandinavian countries where we work uh, the ecosystem has to figure out what the next steps are right how do we connect those and and I love what you're saying Red about that it's people because that's as far as I've managed to deduct as well. People are coming up with crazy systems and databases and software, and but you can't replace the humans. It's the humans that have to build trust. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think that that's what's being forgotten in all of these conversations, that if people like each other and trust each other, they share stuff, and that's where you connect. Merely just bringing people together isn't sufficient. And, and Rhett, let's look, continue with this, because in your work, you've done a, a large comparative study of different startup communities, and what you've found is some institutions that are inside these places aren't actually helping the entrepreneurs, they're actually stifling innovation. Can you talk a little bit about that and some of your findings? Sure, so um, within entrepreneurship communities, um, what we found, um, I think you're referencing some work we did last year with the Gates Foundation, um, it, when you find, when you look at successful communities, and I'm defining success by communities that are creating lots of kind of economic value for the places where they're at, so lots of high quality jobs, kind of a, an impact to GDP, et cetera. Um, what you see is that um, there are a great deal of relationships, um, but the entrepreneurs who tend to have the most success in scaling and building up companies are tend to have relationships with people who are who are already successful. So they're getting mentorship from people who already kind of have built companies uh, and are successful. Where we've seen some problems in some kind of entrepreneurship communities is institutions who are very well intentioned um, decide that they're going to come in and they're going to kind of play air traffic controller and they're going to help connect everyone together. But instead of recruiting the best, most talented entrepreneurs who've already been successful, and having them kind of help guide the strategy and also be the ones to mentor everyone, um, they they bring in people who maybe aren't as qualified. And so they're building relationships, but the value that can be given in those relationships isn't as great as it could be. And in some ways, um, they're blocking people from naturally coming together um, mm -hmm. because they're saying, we're gonna intermediate all the connectivity. Um, and so what we've seen is that, that does not that's not associated with um, strong results in terms of job creation from the companies participating in things like that. Um, and I think, unfortunately, it's something that we do see in a lot of, especially kind of early stage communities, mm -hmm. sometimes orga organized around different incubator or accelerator programs. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so that's what we've seen, is that you know um, institutions can get in the way. It's not necessarily uh, universally positive that mm -hmm. uh, an organization is coming to say, hey, we're gonna be an incubator or an accelerator here. Yeah, so here in Scandinavia, we have a lot of government involvement, and that's both good and bad. Uh, the government is distributing a huge amount of early stage funding and support for organizations like, like Take Barbecue, and they're important like that. But we're also seeing exactly the other effect that, that you are talking about, and that is that, uh, that the government and some of the government or the official entities would like to own the conversations, and they would like to own the network, and it becomes almost more important to them that they are the sender rather than what the result is. And recently, um, despite that, that we've had this conversation really for 10 years and all of the entrepreneurs like myself are saying, don't spend the money on something new, put it into something, someone that's already doing something well. Uh, we are seeing that some of these initiatives get funded and they don't only try to control the conversation, they also uh, they sweep up the talent that was working in the grassroots organizations mm -hmm. because they're government funded, they have much more money so yeah. some of the cool people that were like the, uh, whose passion 
were driven, mm -hmm. were driving these courses disappear and then they get swallowed up into somewhere where they're not allowed to mean anything, they're not allowed to really do anything because they have to play inside the rules. Right, and Ian, you work a lot with government. What are some of the suggestions that you're, you're trying to share with them about how to build <laughs> communities that are stronger and more vibrant? Well, the first thing is to let go of the illusion of control, right? You don't control the ecosystem, no one does. Um, I think that, you know, the first order, well I'd say two things would be the first order of business. Uh, the first is to, to engage with the community for an extended period of time, to understand what, who the people are, um, what the challenges they're facing are. Don't just come in with, oh we have solutions, you know, we're here, government's here to help, like you don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so spend the time uh, to engage and listen um, to the community. Right, um, and then you know this, the second thing is just uh, this idea of um, not not trying to control the ecosystem. Like, stay in your lane, right? So, I think of this event as an ecosystem of sorts, right? Mm -hmm. Tech Barbecue have created the container yep. for all these collisions and interactions to occur. No one's controlling this. I mean, yeah, they're setting up some things, but no one's telling me where I have to go and who I need to talk to. Um, but there's a lot of things that governments can do that, is, that are helpful, especially in indirect ways, mm -hmm. right? Getting your, I don't know, your public policies right, ensuring that your workforce is skilled. These things aren't very sexy and no one gets credit for them and that's part of the problem. Yeah. Um, but, you know, really, uh, we were talking earlier about, um, it's just finding the things that are already working naturally, organically, figuring out what you can do within your, you know, within your uh, power set and either you know and amplify the good and try to reduce the bad. And to follow what, what Ian's saying, I think one of the easy things to do is to actually invite entrepreneurs into the decision-making process, especially mm -hmm. those who are having some success. Mm -hmm. So if you if you identify the entrepreneurs who are probably growing faster than your than their peers in the local community, and you bring them together around a table, and you say, how can we? You clearly understand how to build a company that's that's getting traction in this community. How do we help you and people like you do more of that? Mm -hmm. The entrepreneurs themselves will have very good answers. Um, but I think oftentimes policymakers either don't want to talk to entrepreneurs at all, or they only want to talk to the entrepreneurs who are the ones who show up at everything. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the people, in an, especially in an early stage kind of startup focused community, who show up at everything are the people who aren't building companies because they're too busy going to events. Mm -hmm. um, and so you really need to talk to the entrepreneurs who are getting to the most scale who are growing quickly. Not, no, if there are any entrepreneurs here at an event, I'm not, not dogging entrepreneurs at events. Um, <laughs> I'm very glad that you're here today. This event is different. But um, the, um, it, it's important though that you know, you, you're getting, that people are listening to the right entrepreneurs. Um, yeah. The other thing I think is a challenge with uh, any institution, especially those associated with governments, but others, in, in playing that sort of gatekeeper type role um, or air traffic controller is, um, you know, it, it is a bit of a challenge when some other kind of entity at the top is deciding who gets to be in the community. Mm -hmm. And I think that that leads to a lot of the problems that we can see in some communities with things like diversity. Yeah, so um, let, let's talk a little bit about that because I, I, I understand where you're coming from. Like, let's be talking to the companies that are experiencing the most growth, the most scale. But if we're only talking to the unicorns and we're talking to the success stories, do we have a problem of potentially selection bias on the line and then we have to talk about diversity and inclusion because those founders that we're not listening to aren't part of the conversation. So how can we make that a, a more broader um, conversation? Yeah, and when I say successful companies are the ones that are growing the fastest, I'm not just talking about unicorns. I think you know, if you're trying to put together, and certainly not really at all talking about them, but if you're trying to put together a program that's targeted toward earlier stage companies, say companies that are one to three years old, find the companies in that industry you're working in that are growing the fastest. And that may be companies with 20 or 30 employees. Mm -hmm. um, very different than someone who's already valued at a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. But um, the people, anytime you're talking about a problem in a community, mm -hmm. there's two hypotheses when people stand up and say, oh, this is, I have a problem with this. It's either that the entrepreneur themselves has the problem, it's actually a reflection of their own personal capacity, mm -hmm. or it's a reflection of the capacity in the environment around the entrepreneur. And if you're talking to the people who are growing faster than their peers, you have the most confidence that this is an environmental constraint mm -hmm. and not an individual constraint. Mm -hmm. Because in an entrepreneurship community, most companies are, are going to fail, and mm -hmm. that's okay. 
but we shouldn't necessarily be take. We should be talking to the people who are having more traction to understand what works well and how to make more of it happen, instead of the people who are failing. But, something but do you think yeah. there is a point in yeah. that there aren't? There are a lot of white tech men in the tech community, for example. Is that a thing? Is that a problem? Is that something that should be addressed, or will it just naturally fix itself over time? I think it's absolutely something that should be addressed. I think the truth is, if we want to, if we want to bring in more diversity into the community, we need to focus on integrating the people who are excluded, whoever they might be into where there's already success. Because otherwise, we're creating a separate community where we're just putting everyone who's already excluded into their own little um, their own little individual network, and we're not letting them connect into the success. Um, and so what we need to do is have the conversation about inclusion with the people who are already kind of leading the existing community and talk to them about that. And I think what you'd find in entrepreneurship communities is entrepreneurs are generally very meritocratic people. Right, uh, and so I, I think that it's an audience where most of the time you're going to find lots of acceptance of the idea of diversity and inclusion, but if you don't invite them in, the people who are already leading the community, then you're just going to create this separate network that's not going to be very likely to be successful, I think. So let's take a few questions from Slido. Um, so first, let's start with how much do we compare our own ecosystem to other successful ecosystems? As little as possible. <laughs> <coughs> uh, there is an entire industry on rankings, startup ecosystem rankings, and it's complete bullshit in my opinion. Um, the reasons are many, uh, but I think just to be succinct here, the most important comparisons you can make are within your own ecosystem over time. How are you improving? Is it easier to find the right founders or employees or whatever resources you need? Are founders and other members in the community supporting each other? Are they sharing access to resources, sharing relationships? Are more companies reaching scale? Um, are investors coming here? I can go on and on, but I, I just really want to stress that you know, each city, there, there are so many factors that affect an ecosystem, it's impossible for anyone to ever understand what's really going on fully. Um, and reducing it to uh, a series of measures that are often lagging indicators, um, et cetera, et cetera. I think missing the most important measures, which are how are people coming together. Mm -hmm. um, it just creates this false illusion of you know uh, predictability and controllability and so on. What works here works there. People are trying to re reverse engineer Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley couldn't do that. It's an you know it was an accident. It's a very happy accident. Um, so the end. That's the end of my rant on that. Um, so well, just focus on yourself. I here. think just leave it at that. <laughs> I'm happy with that answer. I, amen. Yeah. Amen, amen. The thing I would also say is in terms of like, where I think one of the questions that someone asked is how, who do we compare ourselves to? I think was, mm. was something that was a component of that. Um, I think a lot of a lot of people in different communities, the entrepreneurship communities across the world say, well, what's Silicon Valley doing? We want to look to Silicon Valley, look to Silicon Valley. The, the way I don't think that that's usually a really good tactic, and the, the metaphor I would use is, you know, if, if you were in in high school, let's say you were a 16 year old and you wanted to to become a better football player, you don't need to know what Messi's workout is because Messi's workout is designed for Messi, and he's already at the very very top of the world. And what he needs to do at his level is completely is completely different than what someone who's 16 years old needs to do uh, to kind of take one step further. Um, and so there may be benchmarks, but unless you are Boston, London, New York, um, Silicon Valley isn't relevant. Uh, what they're doing is not relevant to, to what kind of what you're doing necessarily. Because there's really unique resources in each of these different locations and being able to leverage those actually gives you something that's unique and a special kind of USP for each, each location. Can you talk a little bit, uh, Tine, about some of those unique um, qualities um, in the Nordics, especially um, between Denmark and Norway, for example? Well, the, as, uh, compared to, um, to the rest of the world, there's a huge um, advantage and there's a very highly educated population. Uh, there's very high degree of uh, health medical care because it's provided by the state. There's very, very good child minding services, so a good opportunity for both of the parents to work and to work effectively. Um, there are, um, it's generally a very, um, 
uh, it's a proactive population, right? We've, we have uh, an educational system where you're encouraged to ask questions, to challenge things, and that creates generally for, for fairly innovative employees, if you treat them right at least, right? Because they're not indoctrinated to just do what the boss says. I would say almost as a Nordic boss, it's the big challenge is to get people to actually do what you say rather than what they think is the good idea. But um, no, so we have some very strong ones. And then we have, of course, some strong uh, regional things, like we have some strong industries that we're working on very, uh, very well. Like we have a couple of world leaders, Novo Nordisk, for example, world leading in diabetes, and some of these world leaders in wind power, and some of these are actually actively involved in trying to invest in startups that are working in their own area. Lego is another good example. They have a venture fund. They're investing in educational. So trying to create clusters around what we already know how to do. I think it's an advantage here. And then we have the one thing that people sometimes forget, and that is we have the best data in the world on the population. Mm -hmm. We are registered with a number, all of us, and in that connected to that numbers is our schooling, our health track, uh, healthcare record, everything about us, where we live, what kind of car we have, who we're married to, all of that. And that means in the future there are some almost exponential opportunities to use that data set to create interesting businesses based on data. Right, so there's, there's a lot of unique opportunities here. Let's take a few um, from Slido. So, um, Rhett, is there something that jumps out to you on there? Ian? Um, I think Ian should pick. <laughs> Ian? That's a lot of pressure. I don't know, I guess I'll pick this one. You know, how can we talk about the ecosystem? as a system itself, rather than the population. I knew ecosystem. you would pick that one. Well, I think the first thing, you know, is embedded within the question itself, which is, we use this word ecosystem, and then we forget about what it means, you know, what the principles are of a system, right? It's not, um, you know, a system has three elements, the, the parts, the interconnectivity, and then the function or purpose that that system is meant to achieve. We focus so much on the parts, but really, you know, if you want to change the system, you focus on the integration and the connectivity. Um, so how do we, you know, how can we talk about that more effectively? I think, you know, going back to the beginning, talking about people and community, right? Because within community, um, you know, it's about having a shared identity, shared sense of purpose, common goals, uh, humanity, yeah. right? So that's why, I, you know, I feel like we're collectively in agreement that that's a better word to use. Um, yeah, so. And maybe I would follow that by just saying that if we think about this as a system, and Ian has lots of great content on his blog looking at entrepreneurship communities as complex systems, so I would highly recommend people uh, look, at, look up that information. Um, but I think if you think about it as a system, the first thing we need to do if we're discussing it is talk about um, what are the outputs that we're trying to achieve with this system? Because I think sometimes in conversations I've been in, it's difficult to people are having trouble talking because they're not in agreement on what we're trying to do. Um, and so if it's about creating high quality jobs or it's about creating a certain amount of economic output, um, that's one conversation. If it's about creating a certain number of startup companies, it's a very different conversation. Um, but we need to be in kind of agreement at the beginning about what we're trying to create with the system or community. But is that possible to be in agreement? Like we just talked about that there are so many people and institutions here that have different uh, natural agendas or uh, naturally different agendas, right? Yeah, and that's, and that's part of why it makes it impossible to control the yeah. system. The best you can do is influence and guide, right? Uh, Th there's always going to be, you know, individual agendas. I think, well, for me, the important thing is to maybe identify, identify uh, some values, some common principles, and we can agree on something, right? So a common thing would be, I don't know, there's this you know, concept that I've written about before called Founders First, which is before you take an action in the ecosystem, no matter what your role is, just ask yourself a quick question. Will this, does this help founders? Or is it helping me? And sometimes, you know, you may forget and other times you may be really needing to pursue your own agenda. But it's just, con it's just little things like that that I think can push us towards alignment on certain things. Certainly not on everything. And I think also there often are, there's, while people have different goals, we can find overlap um, in terms of where, where goals kind of intersect. Um, and 
that often is the best place to start um, in discussing systems. So as we're, we're running kind of short on time here, while we might not agree on all of the, the goals of the ecosystem um, with it, without in the community, what about some of the danger signs? How, what are some of the things that you notice that things aren't going in the right direction? What are, from your perspective, and if you have any examples, that would be great. I mean, uh, term sheets with awful conditions for entrepreneurs, um, a belief that a person or set of persons, and especially an organization, is required to run an ecosystem, right? These are all danger signs for me, a belief that one single thing could make this all happen. You know, we talked earlier about my belief about physical space, so I actually believe that physical density is important, but that enough, that, that alone is not enough, it's what's going on in that particular mm -hmm. space that matters. Mm -hmm. But um, so hanging hopes on these single, you know, grand slam opportunities is just, it's not enough. So those would be some signs that I'd be looking for. And then I would say also that if you have more talent that is seeping out of the community, then it's seeping into it. Mm -hmm. Then it's, it can be because the, the system is too stale and that people with high energy feel drained by it rather than energized by it. So hopefully it should, more and more nodes should be growing onto the ecosystem and kind of attaching themselves to the mothership, so to say. Wonderful. That all sounds great to me. Uh, amen. Great. Yeah. What, what about, could you talk a little bit about some of the work that you did where, you know, uh, specifically on uh, whether key nodes in the network were entrepreneur-led versus non-entrepreneur-led? Yes, so um, we, we put out a report um, last year, at the end of the year, called uh, about literally titled Fostering Productive Entrepreneurship Communities, um, which has a lot more information than I could explain right now. Um, but basically what we found is uh, in, in communities that are creating lots of high quality jobs, um, that typically the largest nodes in the community are people who've already had success uh, as entrepreneurs. Um, and so we want to have communities, ultimately, I think, that, that elevate successful entrepreneurs to be the key nodes and the key influencers in the network. Places, I think one bad sign to your question would be places where we see the most, the largest nodes, whether those be people or organizations, don't include leadership of individuals who've had success as entrepreneurs or kind of key executives at uh, entrepreneurial companies that have been successful. Mm -hmm. Thank and, you, Ian. And, and kind of for this audience, everyone that's out here listening to us right now, um, what's the, something that they can do to contribute to a more healthy and vibrant ecosystem where, wherever they happen to be operating? Well, I think that it's, it starts in the small, right? It starts by remembering that you are the ecosystem. I am the ecosystem. You're, we're all here. So it works when all of us not only think about our own interests, but also just spend a little bit of time to say, how can I help someone else? Can I make that introduction? How can I be useful? And I, I like the pay it forward thinking that mm -hmm. uh, if you think of all of this as, as karma, then if you help one person, that person is probably not going to help you back directly, but indirectly, if we all help each other, we're all going to get more back. So I think by, by taking the time to meet with someone who's the level below you, who needs one step up, or need meeting someone that, um, that needs an introduction or a little bit of advice, we're all gatekeepers for some things. Uh, and we all have some experience that someone else that's in another level can benefit from. So you stole my idea, right. <laughs> <laughs> but let me, let me build on it because it's important. So I think it's just changing, you know, what makes for a successful startup community is all these seemingly inconsequential actions that you're doing at an individual level that aggregate up into a more productive macro. So I think just changing a little bit of your, your, mental, your mental model of saying, you know, of keeping a transaction ledger of each person you help or in each introduction you make, just give without ex without any expectation about what's going to come back to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, in unlike other industries, uh, you know, the startup community, the valuable resources um, are intangible and they're exchanged th through people, right? And so it becomes uh, impossible for those resources to reach their intended target if we're gumming up the system by adding in frictions like, well, I won't include these people or I won't help that person because they didn't help me before. And before too long, you've just bound yourself in a corner and you're not helping anyone. So I think just that little change in, in mindset of, well, just help people. It's very yeah. simple. So fostering generosity and very quickly, Rhett, the last word. 
I think um, one of the things we don't do is in communities is really elevate and, and make sure that we're listening mostly to the people, in, the entrepreneurs who are having the most success among their peer group. Um, I think we need to make sure that they're having the loudest voices in the room because it's about entrepreneurs. That's why we call them entrepreneurship ecosystems or entrepreneurship communities. Wonderful. Can I say one very fast thing? Sure. If you are in a position of power, influence or money, then think about maybe you don't have to create your own initiative, support some of the great things that are already happening like Tech Barbecue. Wonderful. Great. Well, thank you so much th to our panelists and thank you for to our audience for listening. Thanks, guys. Thank you all. Thank Let's you. give a warm round of applause to uh, Natalie and her panel.